There were uh, two guys I had as friends back in Saskatchewan, both of whom were excellent uh, at a specific thing. In fact, it was a father's son, uh, Eric, and his son, Owen. I knew them from archery. I joined the archery club while I was there. By coincidence, Eric was the engineer uh, who worked on our church building when, when our roof needed some repair. Uh, we had to replace entire 10-ton beams uh, on the roof of that church, and Eric was the one who was in charge of guiding uh, the work crews and the crane operator as they lowered these beams into place. And he was amazing to watch, frighteningly good, I have to say. With no support mechanisms, he would walk around on these beams, uh, 18 inches wide is all the, the foot room he had, three stories up. And he's walking all around them without fear. You ever tried to balance while looking up? You kind of you go off a little bit. Uh, he was doing that with no problem. He had as much certainty in his footing as a figure skater is confident the ice will be there after she lands uh, from a jump. I knew Eric from archery, but it was his work site performance that was remarkable. His son, however, Owen, was phenomenal at shooting. In his early teens, he was winning tournaments. He had a very steady hand. He owned what, was known, what is known as a compound bow. Do you know what one of those is? What, what makes a compound bow unique? Do you know what it is? It, it's a bow with what's at the end of the, the limbs? There's, there's the wheels, the cams, right? So there's, there's those. Uh, what are the wheels at the end of the limbs on a compound bow? What are they for? There's cabling that runs uh, back and forth between them and the, and the bowstring that's there as well. But what are, those, what are those wheels for? What's the purpose? A bit more power. When you pull a bow back, is that hard or easy? It's, it's kind of tough, depending on how heavy the bow is, right? It's hard to pull back those cams, those wheels. Uh, the axle on them isn't center. It's off-center. And so what happens is when you pull the bow back, uh, the wheels uh, top and, and flip, and that creates let off. So it's easier to hold the bow back here. Uh, some of them have up to 80% let off. So a 70-pound draw, that, that's heavy. To pull back a 70-pound bow will have 80% let off. So you're actually holding just 14 pounds, right? Uh, what, why does that help? What's that help with? Your aim, right? Because you can hold here for a longer period of time and, and take your time and aim. Owen's bow had another feature. He had sights. Did you know bows have sights on them? He had sights. They're an attachment to the front of the bow with a piece of metal that holds out three or four pins, kind of like this, uh, right, in your, right in your line of vision. Uh, why is there more than one pin? For different distances, right? W when you shoot an arrow, uh, you've got to take into consideration trajectory. And the further away your target, how do you have to aim your bow? Yeah, you have to aim it up a little bit higher so your arrow can, can do the proper arc so it hits, hits the target in the right spot. And so uh, you have multiple pins and you have them all set for specific distances and, and you know the distance before you shoot. If you're a good archer, you're going to know the distance before you shoot. And so you put the appropriate pin on the target, hold it back, uh, and take your shot. But Owen's bow had one more feature. He used a release. You see, the goal of archery is to minimize the amount of movement you have to make, even if it's just the slightest movement of this as you release the string. So this device he had is called a release. You know what it does? Well, yeah, I guess that's... <laughs> it releases the string, yes. It's a little mechanical clasp that grabs onto the, onto the bowstring. And then it has a Velcro strap that wraps around your wrist so that when you clasp it onto the string and then you pull back, you actually aren't grabbing the string with your fingers at all. The release 
has your wrist and the release has the string. And you draw back like this. And then you take your time to aim and once everything is just right, you just put your finger on that little trigger and away goes your arrow. Owen was a master at making his bow with all those components sing together a perfect song. Lots of archers had compound bows. I had a compound bow. Lots of archers had sights. I had sights. Lots of ar archers had releases. But nobody in our club was nearly as good as Owen. In an archery tournament, do you know how many concentric circles are on the target paper? Do you know how many there are? There's 10. So there's 10 circles. Here's why. The inner bullseye is worth 10 points. And each circle outside of the bullseye is worth one point less. So the two white rings on the outer uh, edge of the target, they're worth one and two points. Uh, the black rings next are worth three and four. The blue are worth five and six. The red are worth seven and eight. And the yellow is the nine ring plus the ten uh, bullseye. And in a tournament, each person shoots 30 arrows. So what's the maximum score? I'll let you do the math quick in your head. 30 arrows at a maximum of 10 points per arrow. Uh, 300 points is your maximum score. Do you know what Owen would score consistently? Yeah, 300. 300. That means he's hitting the bullseye every time. Now, when they shoot, all the archers line up together in, in a long row, and they all shoot the same direction at their own targets, right? For a, and, and they each shoot a, a volley of three shots before they go and retrieve the arrow. Do you understand what I mean? They take a shot, another shot, a third shot. Now, everybody, are you done? Is it safe? Let's go retrieve our arrows. Three shots, retrieve, uh, bring your arrows back. For a guy like Owen, three shots in a row can be expensive. Why? Because he's hitting his arrows. <laughs> he's, hitting the, he's hitting so consistently in the same spot, uh, he hits his arrows and, and, and breaks them. So the solution, they have a solution for people like Owen. Instead of, instead of a single uh, target with 10 rings uh, on the same size piece of paper, because it all has to be official, uh, they use three five-ring targets. One at the top, one at the bottom, and one at the bottom over here. Because they already know he's not going to shoot anything under a five anyway, so you might as well only use the few inner circles, because that's really what he's, what he's going to hit. And often, he, he gets the bullseye anyway. And so he gets one here, one here, and one here. And then he goes and retrieves his, his arrows. At the archery club, Owen would miss a lot. But there he was adjusting his sights. He was testing out a new release. He was breaking in some carbon arrows. At a tournament, though, he was all business. And it was a sight to behold. Each shot was a slow draw back calm and patient as he lined everything up and then he just triggered his release and the bow would fall forward his shot would go off he'd hit the bullseye just as if it was all an extension of his body arrow hitting the mark as surely as if he walked up with the arrow in his hand and just pushed it into uh, the bullseye himself as good as Owen was there was one instance where he could never hit a bullseye. In fact, he would miss the entire target. You know when that was? In the dark. <laughs> he can't hit anything in the dark. It's almost like God has on purpose pre-wired us with limitation. No, we weren't insane. We never shot arrows in the dark. But that's because we already knew we couldn't. Darkness limits all kinds of things we otherwise might do. In 1987, the Edmonton Oilers were playing the Boston Bruins for the Stanley Cup when there was a blackout in the arena. 
The lights all turned off. They couldn't get them back on again. You know what? Turns out you can't play hockey in the dark. (laughs) The Leafs have done it for years. I'm echoing somebody else. Always light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. Wow, this went sideways on me real fast, isn't it? (laughs) Downhill skiing you can't do in the dark. (laughs) Or you could try. You did. (laughs) When there's a full moon and no trees, right? You can't read in the dark. Although you might be able to, you probably shouldn't cut vegetables in your kitchen in the dark. Now, we like to think we're above natural law. You get up at night and you decide, I can make it just fine to the kitchen for a glass of water without turning the lights on. And what happens? You stub your toe on the kitchen chair that you swore was 18 inches to the left. I know you've done it, so don't try and pretend you haven't. My point is this, even at our greatest strength, even in our peak performance, we have limits. You'd think that would make us humble, but no. All we tend to see is our accomplishments, not our limits. God knows the human heart, and God wants us to learn humility. And sometimes God is subtle in teaching us lessons. He puts us in a world that is night half the time, so we're limited in what we can accomplish. We are limited also by sleep and hunger and bathroom breaks. We're limited by illness. We're limited by age. Sometimes we're too old for a thing. Sometimes we're too young for a thing. We are limited by wealth or the lack of it. We are limited when we don't know all the facts, though that hardly ever stops us from having an opinion anyway. We're limited in the miracle that all of our most necessary functions for life are entirely automatic. You cannot force your heart through sheer willpower to take one more beat. Your breath, your circulation, your brain waves, your digestion, all done whether you're thinking about it or not, and all basically beyond your micromanagement. Perhaps it is because of our limits that we are so proud when we do accomplish something. And so we win a trophy to prove our worth in sport. We we earn a paycheck to prove our worth at work. We earn applause to prove our own popularity. We earn respect when we are of value to others. And somehow within and despite our sea of limitations, we believe that we are all that. Knowing the human heart... Here's what God said to his people in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He said this, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and All that you have is multiplied. Then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. That last verse is verse 17. Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. In other words, when life is going great, don't forget God. I read a great quote from the commentaries this week that said, God took a big risk when he placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in a a place of bounty because so few can handle affluence. Because when things get going great, we do tend to forget God. We cry out in prayer when things are going wrong, but then we work hard to take control ourselves. And so we use money management tools to build financial independence. We get insurance to protect against tragedy. We exercise our bodies to stay strong. We do all that we can to be as independent as possible. But then a sneaky thing happens, hardly ever consciously, but it does happen. 
Our zeal for God slowly fades into the background while we are busy taking care of ourselves. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves saying things like, I'm too busy to pray. My reading list right now doesn't include my Bible. I'm on the road, so I can't make it to worship. I bypass people in need because I'm spending too much time on my own affairs. I'm very busy. The respect I have for a holy and mighty God gets lost the more I become pragmatic and caught up in the everyday routines of life. It's a well-known statistic that the highest dropout rate for church attendance belongs to teenagers, especially in that range of 17, 18, 19-year-olds. In fact, they say if a person hasn't made a commitment to Jesus Christ by the time they're 18, a solid commitment, uh, then they likely won't. And, and the church gets a little bit anxious about that, and, and we look at, well, what's to blame? What, what draws our, our teens away? And we blame peer pressure. We blame the party scene. We blame the influence of university or college life. I've seen all those blamed. But as a pastor who's heard every excuse for not being at church on a Sunday morning, do you know the excuse I hear most from teens? I would be there except I have to work on Sunday. I have to work. It's that age. They're starting to get into jobs, right? Teens who have been part of Sunday school and kids club, teens whose family regularly attends, teens who were counselors at church camp, these very same teens get to a point where they have to make a choice between work and worship. And after all that mentoring they've had, they still pick work. Not a choice between worship and career, a choice between worship and part-time job, and, and part-time job still wins. Now, I am not picking on teens here. Please do not hear me saying anything like that. I know the pressures. I was a teen once. But that comes to mind as a poignant example of the slow leak that does happen and can happen in the Christian life. They're not outright rejecting God but they're starting to slowly forget about him as they gain independence, right? As they start becoming independent, uh, the one who they were dependent on before drops off the radar. Have you ever seen a balloon that's deflated laying on the ground? Shriveled, lifeless, limp, all wrinkled up. I'd, I'd be surprised... Many times picking up a deflated balloon only to find, you know what, there's actually still some air left in this thing. In fact, when, when I'd squeeze a deflated balloon, um, one end would you know, bubble out. And, and I wonder, because there's no hole, there's no obvious puncture or cut in the skin of the balloon, what happened? If you pop a balloon with a pin, it breaks apart in all kinds of chunks and, and goes everywhere uh, all over your floor. But if you just leave a balloon and forget about it, leave it unattended, then it will lose air and become lifeless. The warning here in Deuteronomy is don't let that happen to your relationship with God. When Deuteronomy was written to the Old Testament people of God, it was before they entered the promised land. They were living in the desert. It was hot. They were in tents and they moved around from time to time. So they had to pack up camp and go somewhere else and set up camp all over again. As you can imagine, living in tents in the desert, uh, there'd be sand everywhere. But as hard as life was, they knew God was there. He had brought them up out of slavery in in Egypt with with what miracles? There was a pillar of cloud and there was a, a pillar of fire. There was the parting of the sea. They walked across on dry land and then the walls of water crashed in on their enemies after them. In the desert where there was no food, how did they get food? God gave them food. Manna, uh, it tells us about. bit boring, eating the same stuff all the time, but sustained life. He brought water out of the solid rock for them to drink. Surely anyone who lived through and witnessed all that would never forget the one who cared for them, right? But God knows the human heart. 
He knows our propensity to forget him and instead credit ourselves with the successes. And so this warning was for them. He said, when you arrive in the promised land and when everything is going smooth and when your tents are replaced with solid homes and when the blowing sand is replaced with the spring rains and when you have kids and raise families and see your grandchildren and when crops grow and are harvested and grow again the next year and when you get work busy with work and industry, when life is smooth, when life is bountiful, when life is peaceful in those days, do not get so distracted by everyday life that you forget God who brought you there. So then, what's the antidote? What's the antidote? Our, pro- our propensity to forget God and take all the credit for ourselves, what's the antidote to that? Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to gain wealth, that He may confirm His covenant that He swore to your fathers, as it is this day. I'm sorry I don't have anything more brilliant for you this morning than this. But the antidote for forgetting God is to remember Him. <laughs> it's that simple. I carry with me in my Bible a bookmark. It's this one. It's a cross embroidered on, on a little piece of cloth. That's all it is. Very simple. Got this from a guy named Dan Sheffield. Some of you might know Dan Sheffield. Some of you might have met him. Uh, Dan Sheffield, he was our Canadian Director of Global Missions for the Free Methodist Church in Canada. Uh, so his, his job was to help coordinate our churches, uh, churches that would want to go into to global missions, had questions about it, needed uh, people to be trained for short-term missions trips, all those kinds of things. Dan Sheffield was, was our go-to guy. We invited him one time to come to Saskatchewan to talk to our church about all that stuff, and he stayed with my family at our house, and as a token of appreciation, on the day when he departed our home, he left this bookmark in our house with a note of thanks, uh, the bookmark he got in India, and he brought it as a, as a gift for us. Because here's how Dan operated. Dan knows that to be effective in his job, he would have to travel around to several churches in Canada and, and talk to them about missions. And Dan also knows that during those visits, he will have to rely on other people's hospitality. And so Dan prearranged, he thought ahead all the way back um, to purchasing a number of bookmarks when he was in India last, just like this bookmark here. So that when he does visit and when he is shown hospitality, he can respond with appreciation. To remember God will look like a lot of different things. We'll need to remember to worship. We'll need to remember, open your Bible on your own. Remember to pray. Remember to be generous with your time and resources. Remember to honor Him in all you do. And perhaps especially on a weekend rife with reminders to give thanks. Be purposeful. Be purposeful in thanking Him for all He has done for you. Remember not to forget your God uh, this weekend. Amen.